Vladimir Bukovsky, in Recollections and Reflections of the 20th Century Writers, Poets and Politicians. Iris Murdoch on Vladimir Bukovsky. Michael Kusto talks to Iris Murdoch in the October 8, 1992 issue of The Guardian. I ask Iris Murdoch what she thinks when people say what a good person she is, as people frequently do. She has blue eyes of an extraordinary calmness and candour, which look at you with a steady and quite unthreatening gaze. I'd rather they didn't. I'm not a good person, she says, turning her gaze to the carpet. I'm far too... and her voice trails away. Does she know any good people? What are they like? There's an immense pause. Yes, I've met some good people, mostly in religious houses. They exhibit goodness in a particular way, that of giving up the world. Of course, there are an infinite number of degrees of doing so. There are a lot of ordinary pleasures which one might be better without. Art? No, not art. Bad art, perhaps. Food? Alcohol? Sex? Things about sex. Clearly, sex is a great ocean of temptation, all sorts of goodness and badness. But to be good and not give up the world, isn't that the acid test? No. She still can't come up with a name, a description of a good person's goodness, yet she's been thinking and writing about morality for ten years and the outcome is her new 500-page book of philosophy, reflection, polemic, and testament, Metaphysics as a Guide to Morals. Two days later, I get a letter from her. Re-goodness, a basic constituent, is courage. I think here of those dissidents under tyrants who will continually shout out the truth. One I knew. Vladimir Bukovsky, who was imprisoned, let out, went on shouting, knowing that he might be put into a mental home where he could be deprived of his sanity. What a case of pure courage and goodness. Vladimir Nabokov on Vladimir Bukovsky Vladimir Nabokov writing in The Observer on May 26, 1974 Bukovsky's heroic speech to the court in defense of freedom and his five years of martyrdom in a despicable psychiatric jail will be remembered long after the torturers he defied have rotted away. But that is poor consolation for a prisoner with rheumatic carditis who has been transferred now to a Permian camp and will perish there unless a public miracle rescues him. I wish to urge all persons and organizations that have more contact with Russia than I have to do whatever can be done to help that courageous and precious man. Tom Stoppard on Vladimir Bukovsky Exceptional courage is a quality drawn from certain people in exceptional conditions. Although British society is not free of abuses, we are not used to meeting courage because conditions do not demand it. The off-stage hero of Every Good Boy Deserves Favour, referred to as My Friend C, is Vladimir Bukovsky. The Bukovsky campaign, which was supported by many people in several countries, achieved its object in December 1976 when he was taken from prison and sent to the West. In the following June, while we were rehearsing the first stage performance, I met Mr. Bukowski in London and invited him to call round at the Royal Shakespeare Company's rehearsal rooms in Covent Garden. He came and stayed to watch an hour or two. He was diffident, friendly, and helpful on points of detail in the production, but his presence was disturbing. For people working on a piece of theatre, terra firma is a self-contained world even while it mimics the real one. That is the necessary condition of making theatre, and it is also our luxury. There was a sense of worlds colliding. I began to feel embarrassed. 
One of the actors seized up in the middle of a speech which touched on the experiences of our visitor and found it impossible to continue. But the incident was not fatal. The effect wore off, and on the night, every good boy deserves favour had recovered its nerve and its own reality. From Tom Stoppard's notes to the LP Every Good Boy Deserves Favour, a play for actors and orchestra. Original London cast, Ian McKellen, Ian Richardson, Patrick Stewart. London Symphony Orchestra, conducted by André Previn. RCA, Red Seal. British human rights historian Mark Hurst, in his article Tom Stoppard and Soviet Descent, later added the following to Stoppard's recollections. Yukovsky was invited to attend the rehearsals of Every Good Boy Deserves Favour following his exile to the West in December 1976. Yukovsky's presence had a dramatic impact on those involved with the performance, and Stoppard noted that he felt embarrassed at his attendance. Although he described Bukowski as diffident, friendly, and helpful on points of detail, Stoppard found his presence at the rehearsals disturbing. Given that Stoppard had written protest letters to Soviet officials on Bukowski's behalf less than a year before this meeting, his presence at this rehearsal was difficult to grasp, particularly for those acting out the abuses he had experienced. Ian McKellen, who played the role of the persecuted dissident Alexander, seized up in the middle of a speech touching on the experiences of the visitor and found it impossible to continue. Shortly afterwards, McKellen noted in a letter to Stoppard that the rehearsal when C walked into Floral Street was overwhelming. I don't think I recovered the objective composure which your play demanded. Such a big hall, such a big orchestra, such big themes. McKellen evidently found Bukowski's presence at this rehearsal completely overwhelming, to the extent that even when discussing his visit, he refers to Bukowski as C, the anonymous name given in Stoppard's script. Natalia Gorbanovskaya on Vladimir Bukowski by drawing public attention to the system of psychiatric persecution in the Soviet Union, Bukowski drew attention directly to our personal fate. Thanks to him, we got out of the psychiatric torture chambers. Thanks to him, we are here, in the West, free and safe. Thanks to him, who is now dying, perhaps at the very moment when these words are being written. Our duty to Vladimir Bukovsky, our love for him, makes us, already in almost complete despair, to turn to all well-known and ordinary people of the free world. If Bukovsky is still alive, you can help save him. The voice of each of you can be heard by the authorities of the Soviet Union. After all, the voice of Bukovsky himself was heard, who did not think, I am small, I am weak. What can I do on my own? Instead, he rushed to help and gave up his own freedom to secure someone else's, gave up his health and, one can only hope, not his life. Continent Magazine, issue number 9, 1976. John R. Coyne on Vladimir Bukowski. Bukowski is an engaging man, easy to talk to, not at all formidable, except for those moments when, formulating an answer to a clumsily phrased question, his eyes go hard and he is suddenly twenty years older, as if he were looking inward at scenes that most Americans simply can't imagine. And at such moments the interviewer suddenly realises that no matter how fluently and spontaneously the conversation flows on the surface, just beneath there is an experiential chasm that cannot be spanned. No native-born American knows what it is like to spend nearly all his adult life in prisons, lunatic asylums and labour camps as a political prisoner. None of us has been drugged, tortured, fed on bits of rotten fish and forced to watch our friends die slowly their only crime having been the desire to express dissenting political views openly and freely. And few among us can understand what it must do to the spirit to know that the political gestures you make, 
your sacrifice and punishment will probably do nothing to alter the policies of the totalitarians bent on breaking you. Now can you, under such conditions, with no hope in sight, sustain yourself? And how can you suddenly emerge from those depths, your spirit not only intact but strengthened, joking and wisecracking, as if life has never been anything but great fun? Most of us, if we stretch our imaginations to the fullest, can guess. But Vladimir Bukovsky knows, for such things have formed the substance of his life. National Review, April 1st, 1977 Margaret Thatcher on Vladimir Bukovsky Margaret Thatcher speaking on Firing Line with William F. Buckley Jr. on July 25th, 1977. I understand that one time you are perhaps interviewing Mr. Bukowski. I was very impressed with one of his speeches, which I think he made in the United States. I picked it up here because I thought it put it marvelously. Way back in Russia, where they had no freedom at all, and one or two like him, were determined to fight for it, whatever it cost. The view he took was not, does my voice count? The view he took was, if not me, who? If not now, when? Now that's the view that I want each Democrat, and I use it in the ordinary sense of mm. democracy, to take in Britain. Ronald Reagan on Vladimir Bukovsky Vladimir Bukovsky is a 37-year-old refugee from the Soviet Union who spent half of his adult life in prison camps and infamous Soviet mental hospitals, call them torture chambers, before finding sanctuary in this country. In 1976, he was exiled from Russia in exchange for the Chilean communist leader, Louis Corvalan. He has written a book, To Build a Castle, my life as a dissenter. In this book, he tells of his years in prison and of the attempts to destroy his mind when his persecutors would move him from the gulag into Russia's so-called mental hospitals. Far more important is, however, what his book tells us about the change that is taking place in Russia. He writes of what was in his mind as the KGB drove him to the airport in Geneva, Switzerland, where the official exchange for Corvalan took place. I couldn't rid myself of a strange sensation, as if thanks to a blunder by the KGB, I had carried out something very precious, something that should never have been let out of the country. He was referring to his insight into what was happening within the minds and souls of the Soviet people. All of us in America, that is all of us who view the Soviet Union as a threat to the free world, have some awareness of the Soviet military build-up and the Soviet lust for world conquest. Bukowski tells us of a Soviet Union where dissidents are not skulking in alleys and basements, trying to create an underground movement. They are speaking out openly, citing their rights under the Soviet constitution. Yes, there is such a thing. True, they are sentenced to prison or sent to the mental hospitals as insane, but they are also proving that the 60 years of unceasing propaganda has not made the people a docile mass of willing slaves. From top to bottom, says Bukowski, no one believes in Marxist dogma anymore. He says everyone, including the slave masters, know that the idea that they are building a communist state is a fairy tale. But here is where his book is important to us. In the 40s, when Stalin was burying millions and millions of Soviet citizens in the torture camps of Siberia, there was no word in our press about this. The victims lived in total hopelessness because there seemed to be no awareness of their plight. He makes it plain that beginning in the 60s, when the West began to realise its future was somehow tied to what was going on in Soviet prisons, the prisoners lived with hope and determination to continue dissenting and resisting. Guards would tell them that Radio Liberty and the BBC had carried stories of their hunger strikes and protests, and thus they were encouraged to carry on. Let our State Department take heed. A little less détente with the Politburo and more encouragement to the dissenters might be worth a lot of armoured divisions. 
June 29, 1979. Excerpt from Ronald Reagan in his own hand. Touchstone, 2001. Boris Nemtsov on Vladimir Bukovsky. It is very important to talk to Bukovsky, because after such conversations, everything becomes simple and clear. He is the pure conscience of all our resistance. When there are any doubts, you have to act according to your conscience, that is, to do as Volodya Bukovsky says. Bukovsky as a moral guide. Today, December the 30th, is the birthday of the legendary man, my senior friend, Vladimir Bukovsky. He turns 70. During the era of Samizdat, we learned that there were fearless people in our country who, despite prisons, camps, and psychiatric hospitals, are fighting against the vileness and cruelty of the Soviet Union, fighting for your freedom and ours. I could not imagine at the time that one day I would not only get acquainted with Bukowski, but would create the Solidarity Movement together with him and other like-minded people. A movement that continues the traditions of Soviet dissidents, continues the fight against villains and scoundrels. And one final thing. In 2002, I first met Bukowski at his home in Cambridge. It was a decisive meeting for me in terms of shaping my attitude toward the current Russian regime. So Vladimir Konstantinovich is also a teacher and a moral guide for me. Allergy to meanness, to denunciations, to overcompromising has been installed in me in many ways by Bukowski, for which I am very, very grateful to him. There are practically no indisputable moral authorities left in our country. This is a terrible problem and even a tragedy. So thank God for Bukowski. Source, Boris Nemtsov on the Echo Moskvi website, December 30th, 2012. Edward Crankshaw on Vladimir Bukowski. Edward Crankshaw reviewing Vladimir Bukowski's memoirs to build a castle in The Observer, October 29th, 1978. His castle was more than a dream. It was a real fortress of the spirit. Most readers of this review will have seen Bukowski on television and will have some idea of his persistent and absolute defiance of the embattled might of the Soviet state. There have been, and are, many extremely brave freedom fighters, more than we know, in the Soviet Union. But it is only Bukowski, I think, who has regarded imprisonment and police persecution not as an oppression to be avoided if decently possible, and if not, endured, but as a mark of victory, of positive achievement. And yet there is not the least flavor of the death wish or willed martyrdom about him. He went to prison because he insisted on behaving in a certain way, and the very fact of arrest and re-arrest was proof of success. He is the only prisoner I have ever heard of who arranged his life on short release with only one thought in mind, to get so much done, so fast, that he would not have to reproach himself with idleness and wasted opportunities once he was back inside. This book is a panorama of Soviet life in and out of prison, seen from below. It is an enthralling, if elusive, account of the now famous protest movement. It is the record of a personal odyssey of remarkable quality, but some of the most moving and illuminating passages have to be quarried. Bukowski's masterpiece is his life, and I think his story of what life would have made a sharper and more immediate impact on readers if he could have satisfied himself with setting down quite matter-of-factly what he did and what others did to him in chronological order. Do not, however, be put off by the somewhat Baroque attack. Read on, and you will be gripped. Perhaps it is only through this sort of free fantasia that the author could bear to tackle his own past, and at the same time develop the impetus in which savage irony, almost an inexpressible scorn for the present rulers, and an untamable sense of humor can inform and bring alive a picture of Brezhnev's Soviet Union, seen from the inside and out of prisons and camps, 
dominated always by the fathomless corruption and stupidity of the party bureaucracy and the better-known brutality and stupidity of the KGB. Sergei Dovlatov on Vladimir Bukovsky A normal person cannot win a battle with the KGB in any case, except for Bukovsky or two or three other giants, who are physiologically abnormally brave and have a right to berate those who have crumbled. In a letter to Igor Smirnov, April 28, 1984, Grigory Sviersky on Vladimir Bukovsky Several years ago in Moscow, I was asked to hire a young writer whom the authorities wanted to expel as a social parasite. Vladimir Bukovsky. I wrote down a name unknown to me in my calendar. However, the secretary of the Writers' Union, General V. Ilyin, turning in his hands the paper I have submitted to him for signature, threw a quick glance at me. A writer is only permitted to employ a secretary if he earns over 300 rubles a month, he said quickly and stood up. Can you provide your income statement? I fell out of grace with the authorities many years ago and could not provide such a statement. This general of state security knew this. At home, I jotted down the names of writers who were both wealthy and prepared to take risks. Alas, such writers could be counted on one hand. Finally, by joint efforts, we managed to find Vladimir Bukovsky a place. We have managed to find him a place, but could not protect Volodya Bukovsky. Now, Vladimir Bukovsky, to everyone's joy, is free, and he himself, in his new book, tells how he managed to thwart the diabolical plan of all those Shnevnevskys, Morozovs and Luntzes, the founders of psychiatric prisons for dissidents. Thanks to Volodya, both Pliush and Gorbanevskaya survived. And how many others managed to escape drinking of this terrible cup? A. Krasnov Levitin, three times imprisoned for his religious convictions in the camps, wrote that Volodya Bukovsky devotes his entire life to fighting for the truth, helping those who suffer, and in this sense he, an unbeliever, is a thousand times closer to Christ than hundreds of so-called Christians, whose Christianity consists only in the fact that they go to church. And I, a Christian, openly declare that I bow before the unbeliever Bukovsky before the heroic deed that is his life. Bukovsky's brochure, I have managed to accomplish so little, which also contains his speech at his trial, is the most daring opinion piece of the resistance movement. Although the prosecutor demanded the maximum sentence which could have ended in death for Bukovsky, who fell ill while in the camps, he did not hesitate to throw in the face of his executioners no matter for how long I will have to stay in prison, I will never denounce my beliefs. I will fight for legality and justice, and I only regret that in this short period, one year, two months and three days that I was a free man, I have managed to accomplish so little to achieve this. From Grigory Sviersky's book, Heroes of the Firing Squad Years, 1998 Alain Bessinson on Vladimir Bukovsky I admire Vladimir Bukovsky. He took the conscious decision that it was not enough to be a dissident and an émigré. He took up biology as a hard science because he knew that the habit of mind that goes with scientific inquiry would immunize him against ideology more effectively than any counter-ideology. Bukovsky's way is the honorable way and the only one that can be really effective. In an interview to George Urban, Encounter Magazine, November 1987. Adam Mitnick on Vladimir Bukovsky 
None of the dissident biographies speak as accurately, wisely and truthfully about the fate and condition of a dissident as Bukowski's book. If in terms of ideology and the importance of resistance, The Power of the Powerless by Václav Havel is the absolute champion, then Volodya's story of this type of life choice is perfect. But in my opinion, no one has reached a level as high as Bukowski. Volodya was the voice of another Russia. Through him, it was possible to see Alexander Herzen, rebels and Democrats who did not want to submit to the imperial and totalitarian dictatorship. Like Bukowski, they were able to build their biographies as a symbol of opposition. What is more, he was swift and incredibly bright. When he came in the West, he gave a famous interview, where he explained Soviet communism in one sentence. He was asked if he was from the left-wing camp or the right-wing camp. He replied that he was from the concentration camp. That's the best answer anyone's ever given. I have always believed that Bukowski heralded a better, smarter, braver, democratic Russia. And, although communism held on tight, this is what the Russia of the future will be like. In an interview to Soviet History Lessons website, September 11th, 2021. Lord Nicholas Bethel on Vladimir Bukowski. I first met Bukowski when he walked through my front door in London on 5th January 1977. He was the next thing to a ghost, his cheeks concave, as if squashed by two tennis balls, his hair a quarter inch of bristle, his colour the shiny grey of someone who is or who has recently been very close to death. His story was one of the most amazing of the Soviet Union's last years, He decided to fight the system and to do so without one single compromise. This was most unusual, even for dissidents. Almost all of them compromised at some point. Sakharov, after all, was, until 1968, a loyal Soviet scientist. And for several years after 1962, Solzhenitsyn supported the Soviet magazine Novi Mir and the Soviet Union of Writers in Moscow. But Bukowski never took a single step to meet the system's demands. The KGB, realizing that they had a serious enemy on their hands, tried every way they knew to neutralize him through persuasion, including promises of a superb career, threats of death or mutilation, and offer of a passport to a new life in the West. None of these interested him. He carried his dissident activity to the ultimate conclusion. Each time he was released, he simply went back to opposing the system. It meant that he was never free for long, and all this time he knew that, if he only said the word, as soon as he'd agreed to cooperate with the KGB, his conditions would improve. He would not give the KGB the satisfaction, though. My first involvement with his case was on the 9th of July 1976, when I introduced a resolution in the European Parliament asking the Soviet government to release Bukowski, or at least to make sure that he did not die. I pointed out that less than a year earlier they had signed a document in Helsinki guaranteeing freedom of thought, conscience, religious belief, respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms, and that Leonid Brezhnev's signature on this paper would appear of little value if Bukowski were allowed to die in prison. The EP accepted this resolution unanimously, although no communist was at the vote. A few days later, Margaret Thatcher, then leader of the opposition, asked me to bring him to tea with her at the House of Commons. I remember that she was at her kindest and most solicitous. What can he eat? she asked me. She had read that ill treatment in prison had forced him onto a strict diet. She fussed over him in her most maternal fashion, and he told her, much to her delight, that détente was a dangerous myth and that democratic socialism was as much a contradiction in terms as boiling ice. It was the beginning of my long friendship with Bukowski, who turned out to be a clever political activist as well as a brave dissident. He also stayed on good terms with the future British Prime Minister, becoming one of her advisers on the Soviet Union 
a spur to her resolve to challenge communism at every turn. From Nicholas Bethel's book, Spies and Other Secrets, Memoirs from the Second Cold War, Penguin Books, 1994. Gabriel Marcel on Vladimir Bukovsky Very often it is in the nature of belief not to be transparent to itself, and I will not hesitate to say that in reality few Christians will have contributed as decisive a testimony as this man, who believes that he does not believe. It is, it seems, in 1962 that he became fully aware of the imposture violence and even cowardice that ran rampant around the intelligentsia even after the disappearance of Stalin. He has never been a theoretician nor a dreamer in any way. He is, first of all, a man of action, but his passionate love for truth, that could have been embodied in the life of a scientist, was to push him to such combative attitude that the Soviet authorities took him for the very incarnation of the spirit that they aimed to extinguish. It is, therefore, no surprise that he spent ten years in prisons and psychiatric asylums, and that at the end of his latest trial, carried out, let it be said, in conditions far removed from the rule of law, he was once again sentenced to seven years of prison, which will then be followed by a long period on probation. We know what these words can mean in Soviet Russia. In the humidity of these prisons, he has in fact already caught articular rheumatism, which makes one fear the worst. As we know, he was one of the very first, probably the first in fact, to publicly denounce the odious crime of incarcerating nonconformists of all kinds in psychiatric asylums, which are simply jails. In a heart-wrenching letter addressed to all people of goodwill, V. Bukowski's mother implores them to interview while there is still time to save from the worst this son whom she contributed to shaping. But alas! What entity is capable of intimidating the tormentors in the Kremlin? I learned with consternation a few days ago that during the International Psychiatric Congress in Mexico City, in response to those who would have liked to hold a debate on this horrific scandal, the Secretary-General himself, from the United States, in full agreement with the Soviet delegates, declared that an assembly of scientists should not concern itself with political issues. The ignominy of such an attitude needs no further underlining. And when one dwells on the fact that Soviet Russia has also signed the International Convention on Human Rights, we realize with a heavy heart that once again words mean nothing in the presence of the blackmail over a terrorized humanity that can be carried out by powers possessing nuclear weapons. Le Figaro, May 18, 1972 Vadim Delaunay to Vladimir Bukovsky We'll have no farewell celebration. No bottles will be fetched in haste. You will be followed to the station by laughing chiefs of transit jails. The convoy guard will spit his joke out. Will you feel horrid or detached? Smug, knowing smiles will spread around big city liberal habitats. They'll chat about Don Quixote and then go home to their kids. They'll drown you in their funny stories and drown their rights in double-think. And I myself don't seem much better, all cramped up in my lonely room. I left you like a road-trip drifter on that drab bench for the accused. But this is not how people part. Lord, give me strength and show me mercy. When time will come and wheels will start, drum at my heart in rhythmic flurry. The roosters didn't crow three times. My walk to questioning was silent. The damned good sense was so unwise, it outweighed my heart and swamped it. But I won't lie, and I won't rest. 
Be certain, friend. Be reassured. If only I don't hang myself, I'll be with you. If I deserve it. Moscow, 1967 Translated by Alyssa Orderby.